Ave Maria Parisa, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is the feast of St. Agnes, and so we're going to hear her story. What follows is a mixture of both paraphrases and quotes that are edited, cut and pasted as usual, and taken for the most part from the Acts of St. Agnes. Now before we go any farther, since we're living in an age that's so deeply influenced by Protestantism and its horrible attack on tradition, an age in which virtually everything is up for doubt, it's important to note that most so-called scholars would burst into gales of laughter at anyone who would be so simple as to consider that anything of what we brought to here would be true at all. But just in case you haven't noticed by now, this is a consistent pattern of behavior. The Gospels say our Lord multiplied the loaves and fishes, the so-called scholars tell us, well, he did nothing of his sort. As someone tries to cite one of the traditional lives of the saints, the scholars will suddenly complain that that particular saint never actually existed at all. Or if he did exist, we know so very little about him that we can't really be sure of anything he did. But, and they do assure us of this, that we can, of course, be absolutely sure of one thing. And the one thing that we can be absolutely sure of is that whatever the traditional stories might say, they're wrong. These people are nuts. Anyway, we'll start today by briefly addressing the question of the authenticity of the Acts of St. Agnes. And I quote, The Acts of St. Agnes close by these words, I, Ambrose, servant of Christ, have found these relations in writings little known, and I have not suffered them to remain any longer buried in silence. I have then published these acts, such as I have found them, to the glory of so illustrious a martyr. Close quote. End quote. This Ambrose, servant of Christ, has always been understood to be the great and holy bishop of Milan, the only Ambrose known by his writings in the church. It was indeed among his works that the acts were first published by Sirius and afterwards by Bolantis. Close quote. So the traditional understanding has been that the acts of St. Agnes were collected and written down by one of the fathers of the church, St. Ambrose of Milan. He's a father who was born only 37 years after St. Agnes was martyred. And in that light, we'll quickly consider one other question before we turn to her life. And I quote, How can it be admitted that the church, which so carefully collects the particulars of the saints' lives, the Roman church especially, so devoted to St. Agnes, has never had but the apocryphal life and the fictional acts of a saint so dear to her to whom she gave birth, who has always been her glory and her pride, of a saint, in a word whose praise St. Jerome tells us was celebrated among all nations and in all languages. It is clear that until the time of St. Ambrose, who was born 37 years after the death of St. Agnes, tradition would have sufficed to preserve the details of her life. Yet these details were garnered up in ancient writings, which St. Ambrose deemed it expedient to collect and publish. Had he failed to do this, a thousand others would have had like thoughts. A thousand others would have placed her life on record if it had not already been written in such a manner as to satisfy the spirit of the church and the piety of the faithful. Thus, let the authorship of the Acts be attributed to St. Ambrose or not. Let them have been written by an unknown author, a Greek monk, or no matter by whom. It is an incontestable fact that they give the only life of St. Agnes which tradition has transmitted to us. The church and the faithful, having accepted and held this tradition as authentic up to the 16th or 17th century, the writers of that epoch had no right to attempt to weaken its authority, at least without bringing proof." Close quote. So in other words, what are the odds that the story of a saint that's so cherished in Rome, a story written down a short time after her death, when witnesses would still have been alive? What are the odds that this is a work of fiction? The witnesses would have written up in protest the Catholic faithful of Rome, many of whom suffered dearly to preserve their faith, many of whom were descended from or related to martyrs, all of whom would have cherished St. Agnes as one of their own, they would have ridden, risen up in protest. So what are the odds that the, deeds, the truth of her deeds would be forgotten and the stories being handed down about her would be fairy tales and lies? To ask a question like that is to already answer it. It is an incontestable fact that the acts of St. Agnes give the only account of her life which tradition has transmitted to us. The church and the faithful 
accepted and held this tradition as authentic until it was attacked in the 16th or 17th century by certain authors. Let's turn to our life. The last Roman persecution took place during the reign of Diocletian. During that time, in 304, St. Agnes was a noble girl who was 13 years of age. But one day, Procopius, he was a son of the prefect of the city, saw her. He's immediately attracted to her and tried to persuade her to marry him by promising her jewels and great wealth. And St. Agnes replied, Get away from me, you food of death. I'm already pledged to another lover. The one I love is far nobler than you. His mother is a virgin. His father knows no woman. He is served by angels. His beauty is admired by the sun and the moon. He has encircled my right hand and my neck with precious stones. He's given me earrings of priceless poor pearls. He's clothed me with a robe of gold and adorned me with precious jewels. With his ring he's betrothed me and he's adorned me with the bridal crown. He's placed a mark on my forehead to keep me from taking any lover but himself, and his blood has tinted my cheeks. For him alone I keep my faith, to him I surrender all my heart. Already his chaste embraces hold me close. He has united his body to mine, he has shown me incomparable treasures, and promised to give them to me if I remain true to him. When I love him, I remain chaste. When I touch him, I remain pure. When I submit to him, I remain a virgin. Close quotes of St. Agnes. Of course, by all this, St. Agnes was speaking symbolically of all the spiritual gifts and treasures and the graces of Christ that by means of her baptism and confirmation had filled and adorned her soul. And she was also speaking of those graces which our Lord would have further increased in her soul as a reward for her faithfully maintaining her virginity. But being a pagan, Procopius completely misunderstood her. So Procopius went home and threw himself on his bed and he sighed and moaning that his love was gone unrequited. Till finally, all this drama is going on long enough till his father Sempronius, he's a prefect of Rome, decided to take matters into his own hands. He visited with St. Agnes in person to ask her hand on his son's behalf. St. Agnes said that nothing in the world could possibly make her violate the fidelity she had promised her first love. So Symphronius replied, it would not be possible to make a better choice than his son, since he's from a family of such wealth and power. But St. Agnes was steadfast in her resolve. Symphronius then made a point to make serious inquiries to find out precisely who St. Agnes was betrothed to. One of his courtiers told him that the girl was a Christian. And like all of them, she was addicted to the magical arts that she called Christ her spouse. Now, Symphronius was actually delighted by this information as he realized that he now held her destiny in his hands. And carrying as it did the penalty of death, no one would dare to try to defend her against the charge of Christianity. So yet St. Agnes, summoned before the tribunal, and tried to win her over with soft words, but to no avail. When it became obvious that he was getting nowhere, he resorted to threats. And Agnes replied, do whatever you like but you will not obtain what you want from me. The prefect then told her, you have two choices. Since your virginity means so much to you, either you will sacrifice to the god Vesta with the virgins. Now the Vestal virgins were uh, very important pagan priestesses in Rome. So he's given her the choice on the one hand to become a pagan priestess, or you'll be thrown in with the harlots and handled as they are handled. Since your virginity means so much to you, either you will sacrifice to the goddess Vesta with her virgins, or you'd be thrown in with the harlots to be handled as they are handled. Now, we'll pause for a moment and make two parenthetical comments that might shed some additional light on this horrific punishment. First comment, as horrible as it was, this is not necessarily a unique punishment. To illustrate that, we'll just read a very few short passages from the Roman Martyrology. It's actually one of our liturgical books. April 28th, quote, at Alexandria, the passion of St. Theodora Virgin. She refused to offer sacrifice to idols, and she was sent to a house of ill repute. Forthwith, one of the brethren, named Didymus, by the wondrous favor of God, delivered her by changing his clothing for hers. Afterwards, he was slain and crowned together with her in the persecution of Diocletian. The old butler's lives of the saints has a lot of very beautiful details on that story. May 3rd. 
Roman monarchy. Quote, at Constantinople, the martyrs of saints, Alexander, a soldier, and Antonina, a virgin. She, in the persecution of Maximian, was condemned to a house of ill repute by Festus, the governor, but was secretly delivered by Alexander, who changed garments with her, remained there in her place. She was af afterwards commanded to be tortured with him, and both were cast together into the flames, with their hands cut off, and were crowned after a magnificent victory. So evidently, the pagan judges of those days thought this a suitable punishment for Christian virgins. Second comment. Besides the very obvious aspects of the punishment, there may very well be yet another factor to take into account. According to the pagan historians, to pagan historians Tacitus, Dio Cassius, and Suetonius, all of whom lived several centuries before this incident, in Rome, capital punishment was not inflicted on virgins. Tacitus says it was unheard of. Suetonius said it was forbidden by the ancient customs. Dio Cassius said it was unlawful. So in Rome, capital punishment was not inflicted on the virgins. Not to worry, the pagans had a solution. Suetonius explains, quote, since by tradition it was forbidden that virgins should be strangled, young girls were first violated by the executioner, then afterwards strangled. Close quote. And as we'll see by the grace of God, in this case it didn't happen. We continue. So as we've seen, the prefect tell, told Agnes, you have two choices. Since your virginity means so much to you, either you'll sacrifice to the goddess Vesta with her virgins, become a pagan priestess, a Vestal virgin, or you will be thrown in the har with the harlots and be handled as they are handled. And Agnes replied, I will not sacrifice to your gods, and no one can sell my virtue because I have with me a guardian of my body, an angel of the Lord. So at this, the prefect decreed she should be stripped naked and that led nude to be abused in a house of ill repute. In all the ways, she should be preceded by a public crier uh, proclaiming that Agnes, a sacrilegious virgin, blasphemer of the gods, was condemned to the house of ill repute. At the moment uh, she was stripped, her long hair unbraided itself, and by a marvel of divine grace, it suddenly grew so full and, full and so, under, so completely that it wrapped her under like a cloak. She was then led off to the place of turpitude, where she found the angel of the Lord prepared to defend her. The angel surrounded her with a dazzling light, so brilliant that the place where she stood was as bright as the noonday sun. No one could approach or even see her. She prostrated herself to pray, and when she had finished, she saw a brilliantly white robe lying by her. So she put it on and said, Thanks be to thee, Jesus Christ my Lord, for receiving me into the number of thy servants and sending me this garment. The presence of the holy angel had suddenly changed the whole atmosphere of the den of iniquity, and so all those present were struck with fear and wonder, and marveling at, the, uh, at this mysterious light, quietly withdrew. In the meantime, the prefect's son Procopius had gathered up a group of his friends, and they'd set off to have their way with Agnes. When they arrived and tried to enter a room, they were terrified by the miraculous light, and each one of them hurried back to Procopius. He scorned them as cowards, and in a fury, he rushed in to force himself on Agnes. The angel immediately struck him as it were with light, and he fell face first onto the ground, and the act state that he was struck dead. At that point, one of his companions entered, and seeing Procopius laying there, cried out, Come on, friends, come on, Romans, you who fear the gods. The courtesan has killed the prefect's son by her wicked sorceries. So Agnes is praising God for preserving her virginity in such a place of peril. And this multitude begins gathering in the area, some shouting she's a sor sorceress, a sacrilegious witch, and others that she's an innocent girl, and some even exclaiming at the power of Christ. When Symphronius heard what had happened, he rushed to the place. When he saw the body of his son stretched out there flat on the ground, he turned to St. Agnes and shouted to her, almost cruel of women, and that doesn't translate as well from the Latin, but that's really powerful, almost cruel of women, by what spell have you destroyed my son? He's a victim of your magical arts. Agnes asked, why have all the others who had the same intention escaped a similar fate? I have been offered to and consecrated to Christ from the cradle. God sent his angel to my rescue. This angel has clothed me with a robe of mercy and has protected my person. Those who gave honor to God upon seeing the heavenly light were allowed to depart unharmed and uninjured. 
But he, in spite of this heavenly manifestation, still dared to approach me, was struck by the angel of the Lord, and suffered the penalty which you behold. Symphronius replied, I will believe no sorcery has done this if you ask your angel to restore my son to life. Agnes replied, Your faith is not worthy to obtain such a miracle from God. Nevertheless, the time has come to show forth the divine power of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Have everyone withdraw so may speak to him in prayer. After they'd all withdrawn, she prostrated herself upon the ground and implored of God the life of the young man. Suddenly Procopius began stirring, began breathing. He opened his eyes and went forth, crying out with a loud voice, There is but one God in heaven, on earth, in the whole universe. And he is the God of the Christians. All our temples are in vain. All the gods adored in them are in vain. All they had expected from them is vain as well. So there's a multitude of witnesses of this miracle, all of whom are struck with astonishment and fear. Many of them, even the prefect himself, exclaimed that the God of the young virgin was great. But in spite of the favorable outcries, the soothsayers and the pagan priests are troubled, and they stirred up a riot. Shouts are heard, seize the sorceress, away with the worker of enchantments who troubles the minds of the people and birds their souls. Now Symphonius is stupefied by it all, but in spite of the marvels he personally witnessed, he maintained a cowardly silence. Although he was inclined to release the Holy Virgin, he would not defend Agnes against his own sentence, nor would he repress the sedition being raised by the pagan priest. He left his lieutenant to quell the situation and left the scene. The situation was getting out of hand, so in order to satisfy both the people and the priest, the lieutenant had a great fire lit in order that Agnes be thrown into it. But the flames parted and left her unscathed. In fact, the flames surged out and burnt rioters. Standing in the midst of the flames with outstretched arms, St. Agnes praised God for having perfected, protected her from defilement and prayed, I praise you, Father, my Lord Jesus Christ, because by your Son the fire around me was extinguished. But instead of seeing the hand of God in this further miracle, the pagans, foaming with rage, attribute that to magic as well. Finally, in order to appease the fury of the crowd, which is increasing at every moment, Lieutenant commanded that Agnes be beheaded. She rejoiced. Behold what I yearn for, I already see. What I hope for, I already hold and embrace. With him I am united in heaven, whom on earth I loved with all my heart. She was beheaded, and her pure soul flew to the Lord. A few days later, her foster sister, Emerentiana, a very holy virgin herself, but still a catechumen, was praying at St. Agnes' grave when a group of pagans approached. She reproached them, quote, Miserable man, you wickedly put to death the doors of the all-powerful God, and avenge your stone gods, you slaughter innocent men. And they immediately stoned her to death. She was buried next to St. Agnes. That state, quote, We cannot doubt that her blood served for her baptism, since she fiercely suffered death, confessing God, defending truth and justice, close quote. In fact, her feast day is coming Tuesday. The reading in the Old Divine Office says of her, quote, Immerent Sienna, a Roman virgin, the foster sister of the Blessed Agnes, while she was still a catechumen, burning with faith and charity, rebuked the idol worshippers who were full of fury against the Christians, whereupon a mob assembled and stoned her. Praying in her torment at the grave of St. Agnes, and having been baptized in her own blood, so generously shed for Christ, she gave up her soul unto God. Close quote. You know, sometimes I hear people expressing doubts about the baptism of blood. Of course, no traditional Catholic could ever do this, since St. Emerantiana, who's in heaven, is publicly honored as a saint. She's right there in your hand missile on January 23rd, and as we've just heard, was baptized in her own blood. Besides, the last <coughs> universal catechism of the Catholic Church was the catechism of Pius, St. Pius X, that was issued in his reign, and it explicitly treats of it. And I quote, is baptism necessary to salvation? Baptism is absolutely necessary for, to salvation, for our Lord has expressly said, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Can the absence of baptism be supplied in any other way? The absence of baptism can be supplied by martyrdom, which is called baptism of blood, or by an act of perfect love of God or of contrition, along with the desire at least implicit of baptism, this is called baptism of desire. Close quote. We continue. 
On the eighth day after St. Agnes' death, her parents and relatives were visiting her grave when they saw a chorus of angels clothed in brilliant golden garments. In the midst of this choir stood St. Agnes, also clothed in golden garments, with a lamb whiter than snow standing at her right hand. St. Agnes told them, Do not mourn my death, but rejoice and be glad with me, because I now have a throne of life amidst all these holy ones. And you'll notice that this is also commemorated on your hand missile on January 28th. Some years after St. Agnes' death, Constantia, the daughter of Emperor Constantine, was stricken with leprosy. She went to St. Agnes' grave to pray and fell asleep there. St. Agnes appeared to her and said, Be constant, Constantia. If you believe in Christ, you'll be freed of your disease. Constantia promptly awoke and found herself cured. So she got baptized, and in thanksgiving for a cure, she built a basilica over St. Agnes' grave. It's called the Church of St. Agnes outside the walls. She also had a monastery built adjacent to this basilica, and there, with a great number of Roman virgins who followed her example, she received the veil and spent the rest of her days in consecrated life. The Church of St. Agnes outside the walls is below street level, and so at the very bottom of, this, at the very bottom of the stairs leading down into the church, on the right-hand side, is an inscription written by, written by Pope St. Damasus in honor of St. Agnes. Now, St. Damasus was the Pope from 366 to 384. It's interesting to note that this Pope, who grew up in Rome, was born in the very year when St. Agnes was martyred. So his parents and St. Agnes' parents would have been contemporaries. So here's a translation of the lines that he wrote in her honor. Quote, It is said that the holy parents were common, that when the mournful sound from the trumpet rang out, by this he's meaning the trumpet of persecution. Agnes at once left behind the embrace of her nurse and scorned the threats and anger of the savage tyrant when he wanted to burn her noble body in the flames. She overcame that dreadful terror with young courage and let her hair loose to cover her naked limbs, lest any mortal gaze should see the temple of God. A one worthy of my veneration, a holy glory of modesty, Illustrious martyr, I beseech you to receive fairly the prayers of Damasus. Close quote. During excavations of the Basilica in 1901, the silver coffin made by St. Pius V for St. Agnes was uncovered. When they opened it, it was found to contain the headless body of a young girl. Her skull is preserved in a beautiful silver reliquary with a crystal window, so you can easily see her skull. It's got a statue of St. Agnes on top of the reliquary. And, and on, on the reliquary, it's la labeled Agnes Sanctissima, Agnes Most Holy. It's found in a side chapel of a church in Rome, the Church of St. Agnes in Agony, which is built on the site of her martyrdom. Immediately opposite the reliquary in the church is a beautiful statue of St. Agnes praying with outstretched arms, surrounded by the flames, but all the, the flames are going out from her and seeking out her executioners. To the right of that statue is an entrance which leads down to subterranean rooms where St. Agnes had been protected from insult by her holy angel. To the left of that statue is a side altar. It's got a beautiful relief for the martyrdom of St. Emerentiana. It shows the pagan stoning her while she's praying at the tomb of her foster sister, St. Agnes. And above her is an angel descending from heaven. It's holding the palm of martyrdom in, in, in his left hand and stretching out, getting ready to place a crown on her head with the right hand. And above all that is, is this inscription, Venus Sponsa Christi, which means come bride of Christ. It's one of the lines found in the divine office for a virgin martyr. In English, the whole line would be, uh, quote, come bride of Christ, accept the crown which the Lord has prepared for you forever. So this whole uh, relief is this beautiful artistic rendition of St. Emerentiana being called to heaven as she receives the crown and palm of martyrdom by being stoned by the pagans. Let's close. There are a lot of valuable lessons to be learned in the story of St. Agnes. We'll just mention a few, but anyone who spends some time thoughtfully considering her story will easily be able to draw more out. In her steadfast refusal to betray our Lord, in spite of being offered a noble marriage with the highest social standing and all the riches and power that go along with that, we had a glim gl glimpse through her eyes of how truly fleeting are the things of this world. If 
all the pleasures and prerogatives the world can possibly offer are as nothing as so much dust when they're compared to the absolutely priceless value of our baptismal grace. She shows us how true essentially it is to immediately turn to God in prayer whenever we face any challenge. And we should learn to patiently bear our own crosses, which are so trivial, we compare them to hers. In a time of apostasy, in a time when so few see any real purpose in life, we see a moving testimony to the importance and advantages of our holy faith and a life lived in accordance with it. We get some idea of the absolute importance of our life in union with Christ when we see a 13-year-old girl with all her life stretched out before her, unafraid to lay it down for the sake of preserving that union with her Lord. We can't help but be moved by love and admiration for the mercies of God who so strengthened this young virgin to remain confident and hold fast in spite of the horrific fate which seemed to await her. St. Agnes and Marenciana, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.